Hey, George. Hey, Nick. Sorry to interrupt this episode of Reslayer's Take, but we have to tell the people about ButcherBox. Oh, yeah. Listen, friends, we only do ads for sponsors we think are great, and ButcherBox is on our good list. ButcherBox sent us each a customized box of high-quality meat, and they were so freaking good. It's so convenient having a box of incredible meat in your freezer without ever having to step foot in a grocery store. And the greatest part? This antibiotic-free and humanely raised meat comes with plenty of curated tips and recipes. So whipping up awesome dinners is a cinch. These prices are impossible to beat for the quality, and where the heck else can you get free protein for a whole dang year? Not the grocery store. So sign up at ButcherBox.com slash Reslayer and get our special deal. ButcherBox is offering our listeners a free-for-a-year offer plus an additional $20 off. Choose chicken breast, salmon, or ground beef free in every order for a year. Sign up today at ButcherBox.com slash Reslayer and use code R-E-S-L-A-Y-E-R to choose your free-for-a-year offer plus $20 off your first order. Let's get grilling. Kroger Delivery has one mission, to deliver the freshest food right to your door. That's why our drivers are pros. Our trucks are refrigerated. And when it comes to low prices, we always deliver. With $20 off your first order of $75 or more, there's no better time to get in on the action. Mission accomplished. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Welcome to the Reslayer's Take. I'm George Primavera. And I'm Nick Williams. In this podcast, George and I lead a group of players through an exciting improvised adventure in Exandria, the magical world of Critical Role. We're playing Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, but you won't need to know the rules to follow along. All you need to know is that nothing the players do is scripted or planned, and their fates are determined by their own cleverness and the random chance of rolling a 20-sided die. You can listen to new episodes of The Reslayer's Take every Monday, anywhere you stream podcasts. Or if you want to listen to the podcast two weeks early and uninterrupted by ads, join Beacon at beacon.tv. Last but certainly not least, if you're enjoying the story, please consider leaving a rating and review. Your feedback might inspire someone new to join this adventure. Now, without further ado, welcome, welcome to, to The, the Reslayer's Take. Take. The exhausted members of the Reeslayers Take get their bearings atop Duty's lighthouse, having just administered the correct sequence of potions to restore his self-modified memory. The massive crystal in the center of this room is still illuminated with Idrin's light spell, casting a strange yellow glow. The stream of red gas still wavers in the air, unaffected by the whipping wind, after the reflection ghost Abeleth retreated struck by Farah's spectral tracking bolts. As you catch your breath for the first time since landing on this God's forsaken island, you take in the uncorrupted interior of the lighthouse below. Shelves upon shelves of books and tomes, coordinated by color from dusty burnt oranges to deep teals, line every interior inch of the lighthouse walls. As you watch them, they begin to reshuffle and reorganize of their own accord. The room you are in, centered around the lit, massive lantern, is covered in bright pink wallpaper. Duty's eyes are much brighter now, though he still moves as though recovering from severe injury, every step a bit tender, but the pain does not dull his eccentric enthusiasm. Timpani is just about finished, healing Deuteronomus's strange skin condition, his translucent skin becoming opaque once again. There you go, buddy. Now we don't have to see your insides anymore. Oh, thank you, Timmy. I feel much more like myself. It was foggy for a while there. That Ableth ghost just took up residence in your brain? Well, to be honest, I'm not... Let me see. Ah, yes. It was time. Do you remember time? What, your pet pig? My pet pig, yes. I have not seen her in quite a while. Wait, are you saying that time is gone? I believe the Aboleth has something to do with her disappearance, yes. Well, maybe we can keep an eye out for her when we uh, go try to deal with this ghosty. Uh, regarding the ghosty? Uh, yes, that's a clinical term. Very well. Uh, the ghosty, the entire time I was possessed, was in my mind like a, a, a repeating voice asking for his bones. Of course, I, I couldn't remember at the time because I had modified my own memory. But 
I think I do know what he was referring to. Deuteronomist will push his cloak back and reveal a pink bag of holding. He fishes around for a bit, eventually finding what he's looking for. Ah, oh, that's it. Uh, here we go. Several massive bones crash into the stone floor, much too large to belong to that of a person. Those are pretty big. Yes, Poogs, they are. You know my name? I, I don't think I introduced myself. Well, could you do me a favor? Smile for me, Poogs. Oh, well, I should warn you, I don't have normal goblin teeth. I, I took out all my teeth after I was relieved of the curse of strife, you know, for personal reasons. And, well, I got this really nice wizard to make me a new pair. Timpany sent away for it, whoever made them. They did a pretty good job. They were a little big, but luckily I had somebody to make some modifications. Well, it is very hard to mold something when your uh, recipient is not in front of you, but I do believe that those are, uh, yes, a Deuteronomous original. Timpany, Duty made my teeth? Oh, yeah, I only know one wizard who's good at teeth stuff. Technically, two now. Well, Adrian, I know I've already said thank you, but it would seem I owe you one as well, Duty. Uh, you don't owe me anything. I'm happy that they are being put to good use. Very good job, Adrian. You are a powerful wizard of your own right. Thank you, Duty. I actually hope to be more like you someday. Do you fancy pink? I do. That's a start. Your... your pet has gone missing? Yes. She is more than just a pet. She oh, is... I understand. Oh, do, do you have a companion of your own? Kira takes a small scroll out of her sleeve and unfurling it reveals a charcoal portrait that she's done herself of a much younger version of herself holding a very shaggy, very fat calf. As you look at the picture, you notice that they both have the same horns. Oh, uh, does, is it a he or a she? It's, it's a he. And what is his name? His name is Saffron. Saffron. And time. If something were to happen to Saffron, I would be so beside myself, I would throw myself from this lighthouse into the dark, stormy water below, hoping that the darkness takes me. Let's definitely find that pig. Is time your familiar? No, no, uh, she's very much a pig. Just a normal pig? I, I would hesitate to call her a normal pig. No, she's quite unusual and unique. Um, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Both Time and Saffron sound like such wonderful friends, but I'm just wondering why you're keeping bows in your bag? That is a very good question, and good on you for keeping us on track. Something about them contains power of some sort that the Abolith seems to be after, and, and in my haste to protect the people of Shoreside Isle, I, I, I stole them and, and hid them from, from the Abolith. Did you weaken it by taking its bones? In a way. At the very least, I, I prevented it from being able to affect its environment in a more direct manner. Oh, gee, so the weakened Abolith did all this? Precisely. Farah, listening to this, make an arcana check. 22. Uh, yeah, it might be weaker, but it's gonna be a lot harder to hit. With its bones, it's a lot more vulnerable. Very interesting. Are you suggesting returning the bones to the Abolith would make it easier to dispatch of? Yeah, that's one way to do it. As you all experienced firsthand, the, the light from the beacon allows you all to effectively battle this, and I believe that if I am able to shine the light from this beacon on the Abolith, it will probably be easier for you all to handle with bones or no. So what's the plan? That red gas from Ferris crossbow goes all the way into that well over there at the edge of the island. Yeah, if I had to guess, that's where the portal is. The portal to the other realm? Exactly. Yes. If you follow that gas, it will take you to a sea cave beneath the cliffs, and I do believe that that is where the Abolith dwells. Well, I'm ready to go. You point, and then I will stop. If what you're saying is true, it might be easier to dismantle it once it's in these bones rather than outside of the bones. I, I don't know about you guys, but I don't like not being able to see that spooky squid thing flying around all the time. I will not be joining you, unfortunately. My magic seems to be uh, diminished as a result of my encounter with this monster, but 
I will remain here in the lighthouse, and if you lure it from the sea cave, I will be able to point to the beacon at it, illuminating it, making it easier for you all to take down. Okay, so what we need is a bait. Yes. And luckily we have the one thing it wants. Those bones. Um, before we do that, that sounds like a great plan. Um, I think me and Adrian are, are, are feeling a bit rough right now, and I wouldn't mind um, some extra healing uh, or, or repair. Oh, right, right, of course. You got it. I'm probably okay. Adrian is obviously not okay. Timpani gives him a quick once-over, seeing that that is an obvious lie, but not wanting to step on his toes, knowing how sensitive everybody must feel after their encounter with the obelisk. Oh, yeah, you're doing you're doing great, pal. I'll just uh, I'll just tune Frog up, and he walks over and draws a sigil on Frog's back in moss, casting cure wounds. Frog regains 11 hit points, bringing her to 20 points of health. Deuteronomus flicks his wand and the cupboard doors open, and he moves to retrieve four vials. These are very simple health potions. Um, forgive me for not being able to accompany you down there, but these may come in handy. Deuteronomus hands one vial to each member of the team, except Poogs and Timmy. Everyone gains an additional 10 points of health. Idrin is brought to 12 points of health, Hira to 29, Frog to 30, and Farah to 38. This monster is quite formidable, as are you. Remember, do not take unnecessary risk with this thing. It is dangerous. Hera hastily makes her way towards the door and says, Time waits for no one. The Reeslayers descend the lighthouse, making their way down the staircase, then down the ladder, the books reshuffling on the walls beside them, and then exit out into the storm walking down the cobblestone path to the edge of the island, where a stark, shiny, black-stoned well sits in an austere position, alone on a small hill. Within the well is pitch black, and there is no assistance from light overhead, as the moon and stars are completely obscured. Small metal pitons have been hammered into the walls, creating a very precarious climbing pathway. The air, blowing out of the well in an updraft, feels cold, even in this chilly weather. Not being intimidated or shaken by the dark, Hira heads into the well, face first, climbing down the side of the well using the patons, much like a lizard would. Farah follows Hira, carefully making her way down the well. It sure is dark down that well. I can light it up, if you would like. That would be great. Idrin pulls out a tiny bit of phosphorus and then lets it lift into the air casting dancing lights. The lights separate at even intervals down this ladder and illuminate the path downward. Okay, that should be better. There's almost a flicker on Idrin's face as his nerves make disguise self drop for a second, revealing what looks to be a much more shaken Idrin, if only for a second. Frog, roll a perception check. Six. Idrin covers this effectively. You ready? As ready as I'll ever be. And Poogs and Timpani bring up the rear behind Edrin and Frog. Ugh, what's all this ooze? Classic ghosty well stuff. Just watch your step, okay? I don't want you falling down the well, Poogs. Yeah, you too. Be careful. Timpani makes his way down slowly, but first. It is the visual opposite of Hero's descent. As your eyes adjust to the dim light from Edrin's dancing lights, Finally reaching the bottom of this 50-foot well, you see a dank and murky sea cave ahead of you. The walls slick with seaweed and barnacles, and the sound of crashing waves outside is muffled by the thick rock, creating an eerie atmosphere. The air is damp and musty, and the stench of salt water and decay fills your nostrils. Farah, how are your allergies? I don't, I don't have allergies. That was just like, there was a lot of spores in the air. The second each of you take a couple of steps forward, your weapons activate. Okay guys, we're probably getting close. As you continue through the caves, following the thin stream of red gas from Vera's shot, you find a pool in the deepest chamber that is surrounded by a ring of phosphorescent algae. 
and lying in the pool, completely translucent, breathing very slowly, is a small pig. Hera stealthily crawls forward, avoiding the phosphorescent ring and reaching her hand out towards time. As you carefully move to touch the pig, it breathes in sharply, but then settles again. Its eyes do not open. Hera carefully attempts to pick the pig up without waking it. Roll a stealth check. 28. Hera silently steps forward, lifting the pig gently upward and holding it over her shoulder as it breathes quietly in her ear, still sleeping, or at least in some kind of unconscious state. She takes her poncho and wraps it around the pig and ties it around herself like a makeshift harness. She turns back to the group and says, okay, job done, we can leave now. There is a banging deeper in the cave. No, seriously, we can leave. Around the bend, a glowing green light intensifies slightly. There is a pulsing vibration in the air, and something moves through the reflections of all of the little puddles of water on the floor. I can see you. I think the gate's back over there. Fira turns the corner to get a better look at the green glow. Yeah, well, we see you too. Farah gazes at a reflective green surface in a small, almost perfectly round open chamber just 20 more feet down the cave. Farah is bathed in green light. The trail of red smoke disappears into this portal, and as if something from the opposite side pokes it, it begins to ripple. Farah turns back around and heads to the group. All right, give me some of the bones from the bag of holding. Frog, you take the rest of the bones in the bag. You get upstairs, you lure him out. I'm just gonna give him a taste of what he wants. Tiffany takes the small pink bag of holding from his hip, reaches in and pulls out a massive abolith skull. Okay, give him a taste. Farah takes the skull, gestures for Timpani to hand the bag over to Frog, and heads back towards the portal. Timpani puts it in Frog's hands. When it pops off, Get the heck out of here. I'll fly like the wind. Timpani taps Poogs on the shoulder and they begin to ascend. Idrin makes his way out of the small den so that he can prepare himself when the creature rises out. Idrin ascends back up the well. Hira conceals herself in the shadows near the well's opening, just in case Farah needs assistance on the way out. Hira, make a stealth check. 23. Hira disappears into the shadows, muffling the pig's snores in her little harness. Frog ascends halfway up the well's entrance, the pink bag of holding strapped tightly around her shoulders, ready to run. Farah takes the skull, walks around the corner, and heads towards the portal. We've got what you want. And she waits for a response. From deep within the watery recesses of the portal, a long ethereal tentacle slaps out onto the wet stone, and then another, and then another, and then a formless blue cloud, vaguely resembling a dark squid-like head, emerges, containing three glowing red eyes in a triangular formation. No. The tentacles frantically reach out to the skull, grabbing it in Farah's hands. Farah, let's go. And the skull disappears back into this blue mass, slowly taking its place where the head should be, with a sickening crack. As the skull is taken from her, Farah takes advantage of its corporeal form, whips out her short sword, and attacks one of the red eyes. Roll your opportunity attack. 22. Hit. Roll damage. Six damage. The short sword slashing out is slowed a bit by the spectral goo surrounding the skull within. The damage is halved to three points of damage. The aboleth-like creature twists, recoiling from the strike. Where are the rest of my bones?
And now for a brief intermission. With the planning, recording, and editing that go into the Reslayer's take, Nick and I aren't left with a lot of time for exercise. Luckily, our sponsor, Tonal, has helped us use the time we actually have to create personalized workouts just for us. Tonal learns from your movement and provides suggested weight recommendations for every move, and they even give you detailed reports on your progress. They create personalized programs and workout suggestions based on your individual goals. Like me, I want the roguelike agility to backflip over dungeon traps. And I want the berserker strength to hold a heavy door up for my friends so they can escape the undead hordes thanks to my heroic sacrifice. With Tonal, you can do it all. It's like having a personal trainer at home with you. Unlike traditional gym equipment, Tonal uses adaptive digital weight to advance your training techniques. Whether you're a professional athlete or a cake-loving dungeon master like us, Tonal can be trusted to help you become your strongest, most fit self. Right now, Tonal is offering our listeners $200 off your Tonal purchase with promo code RESLAYER. That's Tonal.com and use promo code RESLAYER for $200 off your purchase. Tonal.com, promo code R-E-S-L-A-Y-E-R for $200 off. Let's roll those athletics checks. Creating really great retail experiences is tough, especially with multiple stores, teams of staff, fulfillment centers, separate workflows. It's a lot. But with Shopify Point of Sale, you can do it all without complexity. Shopify's Point of Sale system is a unified command center for your retail business. It brings together in-store and online operations, even across a thousand locations. Imagine being able to guarantee that shopping is always convenient. Endless aisle, ship to customer, buy online, pick up in stores, all made simpler so customers can shop how and where they want and staff have the tools they need to close the sale every time. And let's face it, acquiring new customers is expensive. With Shopify POS, you can keep existing shoppers coming back to your stores with consistent, tailored experiences and first-party data that give marketing teams a competitive edge. Want more? Yeah! Check it out at shopify.com slash r slash all lowercase and learn how to create the best retail experiences without complexity. That's shopify.com slash r slash. Cha-ching! Hello, halflings! George Primavera here to tell you about Three Black Halflings, a conversational comedy podcast hosted by Jasper Cartwright, Olivia Kennedy, and Jeremy Cobb. Three nerdy friends with strong opinions and even stronger charisma scores. Having grown up in different corners of the world, they bring a diverse range of perspectives as they talk about their experiences as people of color in pop culture fandoms, D&D, and the TTRPG community. Born of a love of all things nerdy, all three of them share personal and often hilarious stories, challenge typical fantasy tropes, and tackle diversifying fantasy, all whilst discussing the things they love. From Lord of the Rings to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, playing your first tabletop role-playing game, or advice for seasoned adventurers, there's something for everyone. They've brought on an array of guests from all around the roleplay community and beyond, including Christina Ariel, Brendan Lee Mulligan, Jake Hurwitz, Lou Wilson, and many more. The list goes on and on. Join them in their quest to explore diversity in the incredible worlds of D&D and pop culture through thought-provoking conversations and good times. Subscribe to Three Black Halflings on Apple, Spotify, Pocket Casts, or wherever you get your podcasts. New episodes drop every Monday and Thursday. So long, Shire folk! Now back to the show. Idrin, Timpani, and Poogs All having surfaced, hear the psychic scream from below. Idrin steps back about 30 feet from the well and casts dancing lights, sending them into the air to signal to Duty that the Aboleth is coming. Deuteronomus sees dancing lights piercing the sky and readies himself behind the beacon to assist his friends. Can I help, Idrin? Uh, Yes, actually. Um, Can you make sure that when our friends get out of the well, they know where to go so they're not in danger? I'm on it. Poogs runs backward, ready to wave his friends back towards the cobblestone path when they emerge. Frog hangs at the midpoint of the well's makeshift ladder, holding the bag of holding with the rest of the Aboleth's bones. Making sure the Aboleth is focused on her, Frog shakes the bag as loud as she can and then leaps out of the well. Follow me! Frog emerges from the well, hearing Frog's shout, The creature pulls itself out of the portal entirely, the skull a bit too heavy for the rest of the wispy form, and it slams down into the stone. 
as it begins to drag itself out of the cavern, moving past Farah, reaching for its bones. Three wispy tentacles slash towards Farah to knock her out of the way. Farah ducks the first tentacle, but the second takes her legs out from under her. Farah takes 26 points of necrotic damage. And then the third tentacle slams down on top of Farah. A critical hit. Farah takes another 22 points of necrotic damage. Farah, the lights go out and you are knocked unconscious. And it continues to rip through the cavern. As it moves around the bend, getting to the base of the well, it does not see Hira, and it begins to clamber up using its wet spectral tentacles to stick itself to the walls and pull itself up laboriously. Hira, as the Aboleth travels upward, you do not see Farah in pursuit, but you may now make an opportunity attack as it passes you with advantage. 22. Hit, roll damage. 21. The Aboleth shrieks as the rapier pierces its spectral form. Noticing that Farah is nowhere to be seen, Hero will hurriedly call up the well for Timpani. Timpani, down here, now! The Aboleth looks down and using a legendary action, whips down with another one of its spectral tentacles. Hira takes 24 points of necrotic damage, bringing her down to five points of health. Hira, make a constitution saving throw. Nat 20. An ooze left over from the attack seems to almost seep into your skin, but you are able to fleck it off of your arm in time. I'm coming, Hira. Just hang on. Timpani reaches into his breast pocket and pulls out two sticks with a spider web stretch between them and begins wrapping it around his feet, casting spider climb on himself before lobbing his entire body head first down the well, preparing to stop himself at the bottom. As you whip past the Aboleth, it attempts to strike you with an opportunity attack. Missing as Timpani approaches a terminal velocity. And Timpani stops himself from impacting on the stone. Timpani unsticks his feet and hands from the sides of the well and lands in a clumsy three-point stance. Oh, gosh, my bum knee. He gets up shakily, looks at Hira and says, Are, are you okay? Where's Farah? Hira coughs up a little blood, and instead of answering Timpani's question, says, Yes, time is okay. Timpani books it down the tunnel towards the portal. Farah, make a death saving throw. Two. One failure. Your eyes begin to flutter as the sounds of footsteps approaching you get quieter and quieter. Stay with me, Farah. I'm coming. Edrin takes a step back and five motes of flame appear on his hand as he prepares to cast Scorching Ray at third level. Fire Kala Ignus. Now at the top of the well, Frog leans over, trying her best to taunt the Abela. She shakes the bag once again and says, Need a hand? <gasps> Frog backs away and readies herself to run as the Aboleth reaches the well. Finally paying attention to herself instead of her quarry, Hira realizes the direness of her situation. Hira makes one last attack at the Aboleth. Roll an attack. 10. The rapier slashes forward, but the Aboleth lifts itself out of the blade's range. Hira disengages and instead heads towards where Farah and Timpani are. The Aboleth lets Hira go and continues clambering up the well clumsily until its massive skull, lit with three red lights, explodes out of the well. Your childish games, Barney! Frog and Poogs must make wisdom saving throws. Edrin is immune to this effect and automatically succeeds. 14. The red lights shine, projecting a horrifying visage to everyone present. Poogs cowers, his goblin ears drooping as he backs up terrified. And as the grass bows from the psychic shockwave, Edrin seems completely unaffected. The beads glowing, keeping the fear-causing effect at bay. Frog, lifting an arm, shields her eyes and also maintains her composure. You're not gonna scare me this time. Suddenly, you hear a booming call from the lighthouse as Duty shouts with a magically amplified voice. Edrin, closer! Bring him closer! Edrin sends forth five multicolored rays of fire at the Aboleth. Roll your attacks. 28. 
28, 17, 19, nat 20. Five rays of flame slam into the creature's side. Idrin, roll damage. 48 fire damage. The spectral goo hisses as the fire makes contact, evaporating. I am Idrin! Seeing Idrin wound the creature, Frog continues to entice it so that it moves further out. While running away from it, she throws a few bones at it. Frog, roll a persuasion check with advantage. Seven. It sees the bones pulled from the bag, the red lights flashing, but first it looks to Idrin and the source of the fire. Idrin, make a wisdom saving throw. 23. A psychic assault is launched at your brain. No, you don't. But the warmth of the fire keeps you composed. <laughs> I will save you for last. With Hira over his shoulder and Pharaoh on the ground in front of him, Timpani pats down all of his pockets, looks around frantically, and then throws one hand into a tide pool, pulling out a translucent, spectral-looking starfish, and slaps it down on Farah's chest. Healing energy blasts into Farah. She recovers four hit points, bringing her back up to four hit points. <gasps> Welcome back to the land of living. Uh, thanks, Timpani. Farah gingerly stands up, Realizing that the starfish is helping her out, decides to stay in its aura to regain more health. I'm gonna need a minute. Meanwhile, back up top, the Aboleth begins to make for its bones. Idrin feels burning anger rise up inside of him, and he throws both hands forward to cast Fireball at the Aboleth. The Aboleth has enough time to duck down below the well slightly to succeed the dexterity saving throw. You don't get to mess with my mind and then run. Idrin uses Chronal Shift to give himself another chance. The Aboleth will remake the saving throw and fails as the fireball is cast faster from Idrin's palm. 31 points of fire damage. It looks like the spectral ooze is growing skinnier and skinnier as the ghost is slowly destroyed by fireball after fireball, burning in the night. Never mind. You die first. Poogs, shaking the fear from his body, sprints over towards Frog. We gotta get its attention. Poogs, yes, but get out of here. I won't leave you. When you start yelling, I'll start yelling too. Poogs gives Frog the help action. Poogs, you are so brave. I'm happy to have you over here with me. A bit of panic rises in Deuteronomus' eyes as he sees his friends encumbered by the dangerous Aboleth, and an idea strikes. He removes his wand from his side, flicks it in the air, and touches the beacon of light, casting minor illusion through the beacon, projecting a mirror image of Idrin in front of the Aboleth. Two Edrins stand separated, facing off as the Aboleth looks between them. Do you think your illusions can save you? A psychic shockwave once again emanates from the creature, and the minor illusion is easily dispersed. Oh no. Oh no. Keep running! The Aboleth lunges towards Edrin, all of its tentacles whipping up behind it in an attack position much like a scorpion. <laughs> Leaving a path of bones behind her, like breadcrumbs, Frog hopes to incite the creature to come towards her instead of Idrin, sensing that he might be in trouble. Excuse me, remember what I have? Make a persuasion check with advantage. 19. The Eboleth turns, seeing Frog holding a massive curved rib bone in her hands. It is racked with indecision as it looks between Frog and Idrin. Frog holds the bone aloft and readies an attack for when it charges her. Meanwhile, at the bottom of the well, Hera regains four hit points from the starfish's healing light, bringing her up to nine points of health. Hera, seeing that Farah is back on her feet, rushes towards the well to see how everyone else is faring. Moving with an almost preternatural speed, Hira kicks off her boots, and you see her hooves clattering on the stones as she moves up the well extremely quickly. 
the three red lights set into the Aboleth's skull are transfixed on the bones in Frog's hand. A single tentacle does whip back towards Edrin to try to knock him out of the way. Edrin takes 15 points of necrotic damage and falls unconscious. Now I will chew your metal bones in exchange for mine. The Aboleth launches towards Frog, who is ready with an outstretched fist. 25. Hit, roll damage. 10 damage. <laughs> the Aboleth rights itself after being rocked by Frog's fist as a mote of light appears in the air at the point of impact, lighting the scene. The earth-shattering blow bloodies the reflection Aboleth. After her punch, Frog's eyes glow, analyzing this creature. Analyzing, analyzing. Frog analyzes the creature's weaknesses, finding none, and realizes that any attacks involving cold, necrotic, or poisonous energy will be completely useless. Acid and lightning damage will also be less effective. Shaking off the punch, it attacks Frog twice. Frog takes 20 points of necrotic damage, bringing her down to 10 hit points. And then, in a careless rage, the Aboleth botches its last attack. Frog, something like adrenaline ripping through your body, you duck backwards, letting the tentacle pass over you. And as you pull yourself upright, you see the three red lights, the eyes of the Aboleth, are directly in front of you, completely exposed and vulnerable and feeling something rise up within you, you are able to take another full round of attacks at the creature, as the Aboleth severely misjudges its trajectory. This is for my friends! Roll all four attacks. Natural 20, 26, 19, 15. Three of these attacks hit, one of them a critical hit. Roll damage. 32 total damage. <laughs> Meanwhile, back down in the well. Tiffany calls out to Hira. Go get him, Hira. Casting healing word. Hira recovers 20 hit points, bringing her up to 29 points of health. Just hang tight, Farah. We're gonna get you back in fighting shape. The starfish blasts another 10 points of healing into Farah's chest, bringing her up to 14 points of health. Farah takes one step, hears her knees crack. Nope. Uh, <clears throat> nope. Yeah, I'm gonna need one more minute. Take as much time as you need. Idrin, make a death saving throw. Seven. Idrin, the rain spatters across your face. You become increasingly cold as the wind whips over your still body. Poogs yells up to duty. Duty, no! Uh. Here goes nothing. A beam of yellow light shoots down from the lighthouse, illuminating the reeling Aboleth, and all of the spectral goo around its form begins to curdle and steam. It's working! It's working, Frog, now! Frog steadies herself, focusing her key, and strikes out once again at the Aboleth. Roll four attacks with advantage. 23, 13, 27. 26. Three hits, one miss. Roll damage. 20 bludgeoning damage. Motes of light spring up upon each strike, dealing 40 total damage. The creature is now vulnerable to all damage. Though the blows are punishing, the creature is still flailing around. In response, it whips a tentacle at Frog, viciously connecting. Frog takes 23 points of necrotic damage, knocking her unconscious. Hira, as you emerge from the well, you see Idrin and Frog lying still in the grass and the creature looming over poops as it begins to collect its bones, unable to put them within its form as the light burns it. Hira's vision swims for a moment, seeing this grisly scene, and then she hears a small oinking. Time stirs on your shoulder, and you hear a whisper in your ear. You can do it. Thank you for saving me. The awakened pig stares at you with admiration, granting you the help action. 
Seeing the small creature look up at her and believe in her, Hera rushes forward, rapier drawn. Roll your attack with advantage. 21. Hit, roll damage. 16 points of damage. Doubled to 32 points of damage. Hera, how do you want to do this? With time on her side, Hera tears forward, her now unburdened hooves finding purchase on the rocky ground. She leaps up and plunges the rapier into this creature's back. The scream echoes through the air. The rain stops for a moment as a psychic blast evaporates it. And then as the skull crashes to the ground and the red lights dim, the rain resumes and all is quiet, except for an enthusiastic shout from the top of the lighthouse. Yes! Yes! Reslayers take! The strange spectral energy that hovers in the air after the explosion settles in each of your weapons, and they gently pulsate. Hira points her pulsating rapier at Idrin and flashes to his side. Unsure of what to do, she takes a stale fillet of old Bertha from her bag. Uh, Idrin, um, get up. Uh, without you, who will I eat disgusting fish with? The old dried fish passes Idrin's mm. lips. He regains one hit point. Mm. Uh. Meanwhile, Poogs runs over to the unconscious frog. Frog, frog, are you okay? Okay, um, what does Timpani do? Um, Poogs attempts to stabilize frog. Oh, come on. I don't know what to do. Timpani! Timpani helps Farah up onto the ledge of the well, sees what's going on, and vaults it, sprinting towards Frog. Frog, make a death saving throw. Two. One failure. Deuteronomus sprints out of the lighthouse towards the party. Full sprint, Timpani dives both hands into his pockets, comes up with muck, and jams them onto Frog, casting cure wounds. She is brought up to six points of health. Frog, frog. The aboleth bones lay scattered around you. You did it, frog. You did it. Well, is Idrin okay? He's okay. Thanks, Timpani. Idrin looks up to Hera, clearly distraught and still quite dazed. Was I brave like you, Hera? Mm, yes, yes, you were. You know, in my mind, uh, you're always very brave. You uh, wear your insides on your outsides, and that is uh, the bravest thing a, a person can do, really. Farah, are you okay? Uh, yeah, I I'm good. Is the portal closed? Not yet, Poogs. That's next. <gasps> oh, that was close. You all were brilliant. Pig. And Hira holds out time unceremoniously. Papa! Oh, oh, buddy, I missed you so. I missed you too, Papa. Did he hurt you? Yeah. He's dead now. Oh, good. And you have these fine folks to thank. Thank you, fine folks. Did, did that, that pig, pig talk? talk? Yeah, I did. As everyone gathers around the starfish's healing spirit, huddled up tight, everyone is slowly restored to their full hit points. After checking in with each person individually, Timpani's face becomes resolute and he turns back to the well. All right, Reeslayers, let's make sure this never happens again. I'll, I'll be right behind you, Timmy. I, I'm going to bring Time back home. And Deuteronomus and Time walk back towards the lighthouse. The rest of the Reeslayers begin their descent once again back into the sea cave, standing tall and strong as they approach the still glowing green portal. Before they get too close, Timpani turns to the rest of the group, holding up a hand. You all have put yourself into far too much danger today. Let me handle this one. Just be careful. <sighs> I always am. Uh... Timpani earnestly steps forward, pulling a string of natural components from his barn coat and begins dispelling the portal. Everybody stay behind me, whatever happens. The air reverberates between Timpani and the portal as Timpani's hands outstretched begin to slowly come together. And in tandem, the portal begins to shrink and waver. Come on, 
go already! It is just about to fully close. And then, there is a wave of energy that knocks everybody back a couple of feet. <laughs> Timpany maintains his footing. <laughs> and then the green light shifts and becomes black, casting a negative photo effect on the cave inside. And as Timpany struggles to close the portal, a voice as deep as the earth itself reverberates. Your meddling ends here. The portal closes, but before it does, a long, spectral black finger rises from it, points, and Timpany is knocked back 70 feet. <laughs> Timpany's veins flash black for a moment, his eyes darting from side to side. Timpany! Timpany, are you okay? Everything goes quiet. Timpany is unable to focus on anything as Poogs gets in front of his face. Hey, buddy? Buddy, are you okay? Nice to meet you. My name's Randall Shim Hoopscallion. Randall Shim like the delicious treat and Hoopscallion like I don't take none from nobody. <laughs> That's funny, buddy. Are you all right? Timpany's eyes don't focus on Pooks. Timpany. Guys, something's wrong. Hera looks at Farah and says, what is wrong with him? Farah takes a minute to think about this. Roll an arcana check. 13. You have no idea. I, I don't know. Idrin ponders if there's a magical effect at play here based on Timpany's veins changing color. Roll an arcana check. 24. This looks like a magical disease. Idrin, placing a hand on Timpany's forehead, you feel blazing heat. He's heating up. Timpany looks up at Idrin. Terence, please inform Miss O'Candless that her milk should be delivered within the hour. I run a tight ship at this dairy farm. Are there magical cures for magical diseases? There are, but usually a healer like Timpany is the one that cures it. Duty. Let's go get duty. Quick, let's get him out of here. Frog goes to pick up Timpany. Lifting him up, throwing him over her shoulder, the Reeslayers slowly make their way back up the well. Heeding Poogs' words, Hira tears up the well once more and begins blasting feverishly on her horn. Deuteronomus appears at the top level of the lighthouse. Oh no. Oh no. I'll be right there. Here, put him down. Frog gingerly places Timpany on the ground. Remembering what Idrin said about Timpany being a healer, Hira frantically checks his pockets. Roll an investigation check. 22. You find pockets full of moss and various plants, all of which appear completely alien to you. Hira holds them in her hands helplessly. Okay, um, Timpany, just wait here. We'll all be right back. Ferris stays with Timpany, making sure he doesn't wander off. And as Farah looks down to check on Timpany, he's gone. Farah, roll a perception check. Natural one. You look around, confused, as everybody has only turned their back for but a second. Uh, guys, uh, Timpany's not here. Everybody roll perception checks with disadvantage. 23. 12. 18. Frog, Idrin, already about 100 feet away, there are footsteps knocking the grass over in the distance. Oh, gods, run! The cube is loose! The cube is loose! Timpany has turned invisible and is sprinting towards the tree line where all of you teleported here in the first place. Timpany, what are you doing? And as he runs, you see a green portal open up on the tree. Oh, no! Timpany! Poogs runs after Timpany. Hira tears after Poogs, going down on all fours to gain speed. Farah follows. Frog channels the wind and flies forward. Frog shoots past everyone and almost catches up to the invisible Timpany, who suddenly becomes visible again and dives through the green portal. No, no, no! Poogs also jumps through. Frog launches herself into the portal. Idrin dives in. Farah jumps in. Hira also jumps in. Wait! Wait! And suddenly, the sounds of the storm on Shoresight Isle are gone. All of you collide with dark brown dust and are in a hot, barren valley. Uh, oh, 
Timpity, what are you doing? Where are we? Everybody make survival checks. That one. 24. 20. Four. Uh, we're in the Utispire Mountains, south of Silra. Oh, no. Oh, Timpany, why would you do this? I know where we are. Is that a bad thing? Yes and no. I know where we can take him, but you guys aren't going to like it. Why? Because we gotta go back to my home. Well, going home can be hard, but I'm sure you'll still have a warm welcome. Somehow, I doubt it. And Poogs begins to trudge down the path. One day later, it is a stormless and surprisingly mild day on Shoresight Isle. A longboat makes shore at a shallow beach on one side of the island and outsteps that same group of heavily armed adventurers as before. Whoa! Who would have thought? Nice rowing drunk. Now be a good chap and grab my bags, won't you? Drunk always has to grab bags. Who grab drunk's bag? There has been word of dangerous paranormal activity here. Following the pattern, I'd bet my delightful little hair curl this is where we'll find those scoundrels. Yes, yes, very good, Maurice. Make sure you tie up the boat good. On it like feathers on an owl bear, Gavain. All right, dial it down a bit. Euphemia, are you sensing for any mystical dangers up ahead? Danger is an illusion, much like time. Your words are so cryptic and mystical, fantastic. And if you would be so kind as to grab my attaché while you're at it. Nice work, team. This is called delegation, and you are all fulfilling your duties admirably. Great delegating, Gavain. Gavain heads up the beach, his party carrying his multitude of belongings behind him. Drunk is looking forward to when this is done, and we can return to drinking and eating. You said it, buddy. I sure hope Taste of Taldori is still doing those four-for-two breakfast deals. Oh, yes. Drunk always gets the Katha over Kaimalt liquor cocktail. It is so delicious. I can't remember the taste of food. <laughs> taste of Taldore? How quaint. Only the finest and most expensive ales pass through these lips. There is a cacophony of crossbows being primed, and they come face to face with a score of men led by a hooded figure on the hillside. And who are you? Oh, pardon me, sir. We are on the hunt for a group of scoundrel adventurers who have laughably dubbed themselves the Re-Slayer's Take. <laughs> Laugh. <laughs> Shh. They have absconded with our spectral weaponry and have been gallivanting around the countryside poaching our quarries. The Re-Slayer's Take, you say? The man slowly walks down a rickety wooden staircase. The rest of the men, holding crossbows, stay in their elevated positions. Perhaps we can be of service to each other. My name is Heldwell, Grim Heldwell, and this is the Slayer's Take. And Heldwell extends a hand. The adventurer, clad in plate armor, shakes it. Ah, yes, the original, well met. I am Gavain Von Eitel, Slayer of Phantoms. Behind me here are the infamous Chosen Ones of the Spectral Hand. Drunk, Euphemia, and Maurice. Hi. How would we be working together, exactly? I believe we are after the same people. Would it not make sense to assist each other in getting what we want? Our goals do seem to be aligned. Of course. Perhaps we can discuss the particulars over an ale. Ale! Yes! Drunk, you scared me so much. You scared me so much and I knew you were right there. We know you love ale. Sorry. Now, where would the inn be on this poodunk island? Uh, you there, on the beach? The heavily armored fellow calls out to an approaching figure coming down the beach, wearing a bright pink robe. This backwoods island uh, has an inn, doesn't it? Do you know where it is? I do happen to know where there's an inn on this island. I'm not quite sure you'll be drinking at it, though. Heldwell steps forward. Hear me now, Island Guardian. We are searching for a group known as the Re-Slayer's Take. 
They have besmirched the name of the Slayer's Take and must pay for their transgressions. If you get in our way, we will be forced to take action. Nothing bothers me more than idle threats. Deuteronomus pushes his robe back and reaches for his crimson dragonbone wand and points it towards the sky. The air around him begins to crackle with electricity. I suggest you take your bags and your men and go elsewhere, or you'll burn. Uh, Gavain? The spectral hand immediately takes several steps back. Oh, 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 all right, it's okay. There are plenty of other inns in the mainland, right, Maurice? Yeah, Big Bee Stand, the Awakened Ape, Poxy Pete's Slop Trough. Rustgard's Hole! Ye old Daves. Oh no, that one burned down. Ye knew, Daves. You would strike me down, sorcerer? To protect my friends? Absolutely. A thin smile curls at Heldwell's lips. His eyes lit with a dark fire. His hand disappears into his robe and pulls out a single gold piece and flicks it into the sand. Then we shall be on our way. He points at the gold piece in the sand. So you can fix your robes. We're leaving this little island, pack up. The slayers take, holster their crossbows and begin to make way for a larger boat on the opposite side of the island. And Heldwell says out of the corner of his mouth, we'll meet you in Shorecomb. Goodbye, friends. You are very unwelcome here. Come time. The tea kettle is on. What a bunch of jerks. The Re-Slayer's Take is a Meta Pigeon production in partnership with and distributed by Critical Role Productions, developed in association with Hero Club. Game mastered and produced by George Primavera and Nick Williams. Featuring Nick Williams as Timpani Guff, George Primavera as Poogs, Jasmine Bilar as Hira Agnihart, Jasmine Chung as Farah, Jasper Cartwright as Edrin Shadowstep, and Caroline Lux as Frog. With special guest Christian Navarro as Deuteronomus. Also featuring Laura Bailey as Time the Pig, Dylan McCullum as Gavain, Marty Abby Schneider as Maurice, Lelia Symington as Euphemia, and Gabe Greenspan as Drunk Stone Fist. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.